What's up, everyone? Welcome in. Another nice new edition of Celtics Beat, and all is well in the Seas world. Four straight wins. It's now 15 of 17, uh, 17 of 20. If you want something a little cleaner, you could even go deeper, call it 22 of 28. The message here, folks, is the Celtics are winning far more than they are losing, and we are enjoying it. I'm Adam Kaufman, Evan Valenti back with us, and, and I don't know, part-time writer, full-time photographer. It's tough to tell when I'm looking at Instagram, but I know the man is very busy in both fields. Jared Weiss from The Athletic. How are you, bud? It's always good to be here just to talk about my photography career. <laughs> there you go. It's it's blossoming. It's blooming. You're doing well. Very artistic, I would say. Yeah, I don't really... I'm not one of those people who uses my IG to like put crappy iPhone photos of Jason Tatum at the podium and stuff like that. Like <laughs> I, I do it for my fun. There you go. What's the pick? I, I, there's a pick of you like with a neon sign over you with like a king chair. That was my maybe my favorite pick of you in the history of pictures, Jared. It was incredible. I'm, I'm not quite sure where that is, but it's awesome. Uh, let's just say I can't disclose the location. <laughs> it's underground nightclub. <laughs> it's a speakeasy somewhere. We're fine. I'll, I'll say that I was at my friend's bachelor party and I had to Photoshop out the uh, thing on the wall that said where we are. <laughs> but it was a good photo, so you know I had to. I had to it's a it. it's a great photo. As I said, <laughs> hang in the loop. We're good. It's the kind of place that you can only get into when you you know you got to knock on the door or somebody you know opens the little eye slit and asks for a password, but the password isn't a word. It's just a combination of sounds that you got to knock on on the door to. It's really next level stuff. Why yeah, with the beer fest, fest is what is basically what happened. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. You know, you went to Germany and you took part in beer fest. <laughs> exactly. I actually did go to Germany. Uh, I went to one of those beer fest things years ago. It was pretty fun. I would not have stood. Uh, what if it's anything like watching the movie, which it probably isn't? I would not have held up well. Wait, yeah, you're was, telling me what? beer fest isn't accurate? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> it's, I, I, yeah, I think that's where I'm going with this. <laughs> I think I think it's a tad embellished. Probably yeah, I mean, we, by uh, by all, the broken we've lizard. Been there. We've all been there where we're drowning at the bottom of a, of a 15 foot tall vat of beer, and you just try to drink your way out. That happens to all of us. Who doesn't want to try Das Boot though? You just got to yeah, know when to turn it. We've all been to college. Weiss is definitely the anchor guy in the Das Boot challenge. No question. <laughs> uh, no, I cannot chug beer. I, I I was horrible at that. I always lost at a flip cup every time. Okay, well now we know. Next time we get together and uh, no waste and, flip cup, we're fun. Yeah, you know, yeah, and COVID's not a thing. You know, we <laughs> no no sharing cups, obviously. And yeah, we we can't be on the same team, unfortunately. That's are okay. Past, are we past cup? Are, are we not past cup sharing? Like I haven't seen anybody wearing a mask uh, in a while at this point. I feel like. True. As soon, as soon as as soon as pandemic's over, I'm immediately sharing cups with everyone. <laughs> I just, I can't wait to take drinks out of other people's cups. <laughs> Complete strangers, bring them over. What are you having? You know what? I don't care. Let me let me just just a quick sip. Yeah, whatever. Um, Whatever's in that cup. It sounds just like college. All right, let, okay. let's we can talk. Let's get talk so, yeah. There, yeah, there's there's a lot Celtics related and and a bit beyond to get into here. And uh, and, and again, just the overview. I told you about all the winning the team has been doing. They're fifth place in the East, but just two games out of second behind the Bucks. They're four out of first and and the Miami Heat right now. Again, things are going well, and they're taking this four game win streak into back to the guard Friday night, coming out of Charlotte, facing Detroit, a, a Pistons team that's given them an odd amount of trouble this year. But they have beaten them in two out of three. So we'll see how this next one goes. You got the Mavs after that, and Luca and. It's just been, it's been great. It's been great. But I, I, and, and I, to, to go full grandy here for a second, that was the most recent one against the Hornets was the 12th, the 12th straight win for Boston against a team, either in the playoff or play in tournament picture. So even, and I know Charlotte's sub 500, but we can even put aside that whole narrative. Boston doesn't beat good teams and you know, they're, they're beating good teams. They're beating good players. They're, they're, they're doing what they should be doing. It's not just winning games by 30 points against crap teams that have no hope of of sniffing even the play in tournament they are beating the teams they need to beat and beyond they're beating the teams that even people don't expect them to beat like the nets when they have a, a healthy kevin durant and a kyrie irving and all of that but if there's one thing here and you know jared you've been on a number of times evan you're on every single week with me and and even if you're not on you're producing you hear every single show so please do either of you but evan in particular disagree if if i am inaccurate about this if there's one thing that i am proud of as it relates to this show i hope listeners would agree is that we really don't ride the wave here 
you know, we, we don't call a guy, you know, for call for a guy to be fired if, if more patience is required. You know, we don't demand a, an all-star or all-star caliber player be traded just because ah, they're redundant. They, they don't like each other and they can't coexist. No, you try and figure out a way. You, you, you don't say a guy needs to be benched if, if that's not ultimately the solution. I, I think that we're, we're very measured. We don't say a team is, is, is a contender if it's not actually a contender. I think we're pretty realistic with what this team is. And so we also don't say that a guy is most valuable player of the league when he's not even close to most valuable player of the league, he's averaging 42 points the last four games. He's got however many, you know, 30 plus games in a row. He's been incredible. He is just turned 24. He's entering his prime. He's not even there yet. I do believe guys, I really do believe Jason Tatum at some point in his career, which is just barely off the ground. He will be a most valuable player or he will be realistically in the most valuable player conversation. And maybe Jared, you're the writer here. Maybe there's this is semantics on my part. When we look at a guy and say he's in the MVP conversation, to me, that means he needs to actually have a shot at winning the award. Not a la Isaiah Thomas, you know, back in 2017, finish fifth and get a couple of votes, but not even sniff the award at the end of the season. Am I am I wrong here? Yeah, you're I, mean, I don't really give a crap about these semantic things, but like at the end of the day, he's not in contention for the number one spot. He's more in contention for the fifth spot. And really, it would have to it, he would have to average like 35 a night here on out and they would have to somehow catch Miami and get the number one seed for him to even sniff that top five, he's it's just too late for him to get to number one. I mean, something, maybe if he averaged like 40 a game over the next, whatever, 18 that are left, and he got pretty much right up to the scoring title, maybe that's how he would get there. But like Giannis is, I think, going to win the scoring title. He's like right up there, and he's playing still great defense, and the team is a little bit better than Boston right now. And we obviously think they're probably going to be a lot better in the playoffs. But, like, he's already up there. And Bede has been doing what Tatum's doing right now. He's been doing it for a longer period of time. The team has been winning a little bit more. Um, and he – I mean, Tatum's a really, really good wing defender. But Embiid is is an even better defender at a more central position. So – he pretty, I think he's on a pretty clear other tier. And then Jokic is having one of those classic incomprehensible performance on a team that's crumbling around him and still keeping them completely afloat. So that's why a lot of people have him as a favorite. You just can't really compete with those things. And DeRozan has been doing what, what, uh, what Tatum is doing for most of the season and the insane clutchness stuff and all that. The team is dramatically overachieving. So it's really competing. I'm, I must have forgotten somebody at this point, but like he's competing with guys like Luca and Ja, who's been super hot lately for, you know, for that fifth spot, I think at this point. And again, he would have to just keep doing what he's been doing for the past two weeks for the rest of the year. And the Celtics would have to continue to move up those standings if he was actually going to crack that top five, which is fine because the team was a mess earlier in the year. He was shooting really poorly most of the season. He's grown tremendously throughout the season. You know, he's gone from being as like, oh, wow, he's actually starting to put the playmaking together at the beginning of the year to like now he's actually a really good playmaker and is completely controlling games right now. So he's made all the progress. And next year, maybe that's the year where he starts to actually crack, crack the top five of the MVP conversation, which would make sense because he just turned 24, right? Right. Yeah, or 19 again. Or, or 19 yeah, for 19, the yeah, whatever. Sixth yeah, time like or whatever it is. 24 is probably the age where, like, the really nascent prodigies start to crack the MVP. You know, I think he's he's on track right now to be an MVP contender. Which, by the way, Evan, is okay. Yeah. Like, why do, why do we need to validate Jason Tatum's insane success that he has had of late? Like, why do we always need to, as fans in general, and Celtics fans are really guilty of this, why do we need to go to that next level where it's like, yeah, of course, like he was an all-star, you know, an all-star starter as a replacement for Durant. I absolutely believe that he is going to be an all-NBA guy, whichever team he falls on. He's going to be an all-NBA guy this year. Why do we need to say he's in the MVP conversation just because he might get like a few third place votes and lose in a landslide to Jokic or Embiid or Giannis or whoever it is? Because we need to justify like our craziness just as a fan. I think, I think, I think this is like relative. This isn't just... Celtics fans, right, that are that are prone to doing this. It's just very loud lately because of Tatum's performances lately. But I think everybody wants their best player to be 
front and center, uh, ahead of the spotlight in terms of, you know, getting recognition, positive recognition from media outlets, from other fans, from just the Twitter discourse in general. So I, the fact that it took this long for Tatum to ascend to this particular point in the hierarchy of the MVP candidate candidacy, that it just, you know, we're making up for lost time, essentially. There is no shame in having Tatum miss out on a top five MVP vote. There is no shame in that. Uh, pretty sure you can win a championship with a guy that's maybe a top five player in the league that year. So uh, he has been, I mean, it's it's a culmination of everything, as Jared said. I mean, the defensive stuff, too, that you're seeing recently has been really awesome. The playmaking, you know, it, what, I, what makes me laugh is people that are like, oh, Tatum's just starting to put this together. I'm like, no, this has been happening actually pretty much the entire season is just happening with less hiccups now. I mean, you're seeing him get off doubles uh, really, really quickly instead of holding it and trying to, you know, prod exactly where he needs to go. He knows exactly where he needs to go as soon as double, you know, as soon as the second guy comes up, he knows where the ball needs to go. And people are uh, either Grant Williams having a great year or Al Horford starting to find a shot again or whatever. They've had much more success with Tatum being this new version of himself. It's been, you know, I, I'd say, you know, beginning of the part of the season, there was there was bumps and bruises along the way. But once the counter hit 2020, it's like, wow, this is a really special player. And now he's scored a couple of times in the 40s and 50s and upper 30s. And it's on national television. Everybody gets to see it. Um, but there is no shame in this. Tatum is not going to win the MVP award. He should not even sniff this award. Um, but he's had a great season. Now, how great is the question? Is he a first team all NBA guy? That's going to be tough. Real tough list to crack there. Could he make the second team? I think there's a real shot at that. And obviously, if he didn't make an all NBA team this year, I would be stunned if he didn't make one. But oh, you know, if you're one of the 10 best, one of the 15 best players in the league, which I believe Tatum is uh cemented himself in that conversation, that's a really good place to be. When, as Jared pointed out, you're only 24 years old. There's more growth coming. So, you know, Tatum has taken maybe a backseat to John Morant in terms of young talent this year. Um, Jaw's been, I mean, utterly fun to watch. And even like the other night, they were playing the Pelicans, and you know, Jaw's having such a great year that he dribbles the he dribbles the ball, loses it, goes behind him like five feet, and then notices there's two seconds left in the shot clock, hoists up a 35 footer, and it goes in. It's like, yeah, that's just the season Jaw's having. It's electric. Tatum is right there, and and anybody that claims that they want, you know, Tatum over Jaw, Jaw over Tatum, it's just a personal preference. Both these guys have been tremendous. Tatum has been amazing. Is he a top five player? No, but he's close. And that's a really good place to be when you're trying to build a contender between two guys that are 24 and 25. That's awesome. So uh, we could, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you to stop because I'm just going to join the, the interactions on Twitter, but he's not, he's not going to finish top five. Just saying to me, uh, again, social media, there's this need to like Jason Tatum. He's, he's emerged. He's a top five guy now. Well, maybe he's played like a top five guy over the last few weeks. He's not a top five player in the NBA and that's okay. I believe he will be. I believe that is still a ceiling for him, but he's not there yet. I don't believe he's a superstar yet. He will be. I do believe he will be, but I'm not ready to call him that yet. But again, it, I, I suppose, I don't know what your definition is. It sort of comes down to how many people can be a superstar in your mind? Like to, to some people, you know, they'll say, well, well, the NBA is 25 superstars. Well, no, it doesn't. It is, you know, 25 all-stars. But like, to me, a superstar is that next level of special. Like you've got to be a top 10 player to be a superstar. And, and I think, you know, Jason Tatum is sniffing that. Certainly he's, he's on the verge. He's on the precipice. And I think the, the turn he's made in the last couple of months, that's what a superstar looks like. He controls the game really on both ends, not as much on the defensive end because he's just not directly involved as much. But he's running the offense for an entire game and is pretty comfortable handling any package that they throw at him and is playmaking pretty well. I, I really think it's that in February, we started seeing him getting doubles and he would kind of like walk a double team into a part of the court where he'd want it and just throw an overhead pass to like Grant Williams out in the corner on the other side of the floor. That's the superstar stuff. It's the stuff when you just kind of walk into the middle of the room and just kind of start dictating everything like your John Wick or, you know, one of those like <laughs> over the top combat movies where the guy's just like standing still, just like going like, I guess, I guess it was like Neo in the Matrix. He's just like standing yeah. still, just like deflecting everybody, punching him. Like that's one, one that's Keanu movie or another is what you're saying. 
any it's just basically if you're like Keanu Reeves, yeah. point break, yeah, on, he was you know on the ground just shooting at the sky screaming. Remember at the end of that Brooklyn game when they had this great defensive possession on Katie, like right at the end of the game, and he somehow split the double. Rob comes up to stop him and he just like hops to the side and pulls up right over Rob and buries a 10 footer. Like that shot, I watched that shot and I just shook my head for like a minute straight because it was he it, it just he could see everything happening before it started to happen. Like he started hopping in that direction, just knowing Rob was coming even before Rob started moving. It's that kind of stuff where you're just, you know, it's funny. Tatum, he said to me last night, he's mentioned this a few times. Like, I don't predetermine what I'm doing out there. I'm just taking what the defense gives me that kind of blah, blah, blah stuff. I think the irony to it is that when you hit that superstar level, you are predetermining what you're doing. So you get into that move just a split second earlier than you used to. And that allows you to get these open looks or make these open passes way more than he used to. And like, we don't really see him taking that big sidestep anymore. He doesn't use a lot of those moves because he just gets to a point where he's already in the spot anyway. And he hits the guy at the right moment that he doesn't need to jump five feet away from him so that he can get an open look. Like he's, things are easier for him. And that level of ease, I think, is what makes a superstar. And so he's been there for a couple months now, probably long enough for us to expect that he's there at this point. But, you know, that happened last year. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is, he's clearly another evolution from last year. Last year was a point where we're like, all right, he's starting to actually show that he's knocking on that superstar door. I think now it's that moment where he's showing that he's actually opened that door and walked into it. And I mean, the sustainability question is always the, is always the thing with him. He's shown every year that he sustains it through the playoff run. It's just that the next year he'll come back and something will go wrong. But you no, know, he hasn't been, he's not that far into his career. So I'd imagine if he's getting there now, he's probably going to stay there. Well, so how about this? You know, to all the people that are just, you know, angrily sitting there typing in the YouTube live chat as, as they're out, you. watching the video. Like if ever there were a, a perfect picture of semantics, it would be this right here. I'm not ready to concede he's a superstar, but I will absolutely acknowledge that he is playing like a superstar right now. So, you know, in, in that sense, I'll I'll totally agree with you. And and one great, you know, image of that or example of that that we've seen certainly you know during this run that he's had but you know at different points of the season as well but especially over the last you know few weeks month and a half whatever it's been has been what you know he inevitably uh, it's going to wind up on a t-shirt what he coined last night and talking with the media angry tatum you know asked about obviously what he did in the fourth quarter there and, and and in the third quarter and just you know took over in the the second half of that game to turn a very close game in charlotte against the hornets into a, a blowout and you know i saw i think it was bill simmons tweeted out last night you know is is this is Jason Tatum season the best we've seen from a Celtic since, you know, Kevin Garnett, who obviously is getting his jersey up in the rafters on Sunday. And, and most people agreed. And Grandy, who was on last week, weighed in and said, you know, I, I would say 100 percent yes. And, you know, what I was thinking about was, you know, for, for a while, you know, we were sort of, you know, giving like Isaiah Thomas and that MVP caliber season, that top five finish you know, sort of that credit, but the one among others, I guess, but one huge difference between that season with it and this season, obviously with Tatum, Tatum does it on both ends of the floor. You know, Isaiah Thomas obviously was a defensive liability for all that he did in the fourth quarter. He kind of had to offensively because, you know, they were letting up as many points as they were as well. You know, the whole King in the fourth thing always sort of masked, you know, how terrible he was defensively as, as part of that unit, Jason Tatum, is an elite defensive player, you know, amped up by what he's done lately. I think it was 16 or 18 against the Hornets, uh, you know, and, and great games against the Nets, against the Grizzlies, you name it. He's been incredible. That's it's that next level of progression that, you know, sort of what you were alluding to before Jared, when, when you say like, he can just walk into the room, walk into the middle and start dictating. He is now taking over at a level, especially a consistent level that we've never seen from him before. Yeah, it's funny. The IT question is interesting because, sure, you could give him the tiebreaker on defense, and obviously defense is what defines this team, so it makes a lot of sense there. But what IT did that year, just the the number of insane clutch performances that he had in the fourth quarter, especially in that January run, it's hard to put anything over that at this point. That, that was just so special, and it had this emotion to it that this run doesn't quite have. Sure. Um, so, and I mean, part of that is that everything with IT is so unbelievable that it does create that environment that Tatum doesn't quite create. It's just because, like, how could he? He's a physical marvel. So, 
Well, he would, I mean, he's a would be top pick in the draft and Ainge's eyes was number one, basically. And then it was that, you know, consistently underdog unsung, you know, last pick in the draft, all that stuff that, yeah. I mean, from a story standpoint, you could it never was a fairy tale. It yeah. was, it was the absolute basketball fairy tale of my lifetime. I'm sure there's a few other good candidates, but um, like that, I don't, I just Insanity. don't you can ever, so like Tate, yes, that's a good one. No, but this, that was on another level because Isaiah ended up being a MVP caliber player that night or yeah. that year. So he, he sustained that whole thing mm-hmm. um, and he propelled that team. They were a drastic overachieving team. So I don't think you can beat it as far as what's the most important memorable season in like the last whatever decade or so, but Tatum, you know, I guess his overall impact, you could probably say on offense is almost at that level. Not quite, but like almost at that level um, and has been, but like, and then on the defensive end is bigger. So yeah, you could probably give him the edge as far as raw performance. But, you know, it's like when we talk about this stuff, who cares about the raw performance stuff? It's like, how do you <laughs> remember it? And like, I remember that IT season being the most fun season that I've covered. Can we clean yeah, this up was, before we go to like some whatever break that you have planned to I just, the point being, we all agree Tatum's not a superstar yet. He's knocking on the door. Would a deep playoff run against a, what is a gauntlet of an Eastern Conference, like getting to the Eastern Conference Finals or getting to the NBA Finals, or uh, you know, if you want to go all the way here, win an NBA title, like what what level do we say, it, or is it not even possible that Tatum has entered the superstar level? Like if he got to the Eastern Conference Finals against you know the Sixers and or against the the Bucks and lost in six or seven games to the, the eventual NBA champion or something like that. Is that, would that qualify Tatum in that superstar range or do we need to see it carry over to the next season with this new domination? That's, that's, I guess, you know, is it possible that we finish 2022 this season, 21, 22 and say, yup, Tatum's for sure a superstar. Do we need to wait even longer? Uh, Either you know, not, I mean, it, if he does this in the playoffs, or if he's averaging like thirty and five in the playoffs, and they don't completely fall on their face, then yeah, hmm. he's obviously a superstar. I mean, he's going to be. I, I I'd be surprised if there's no way he's going to make first team All NBA. Like even if KD doesn't play enough games, like I, I think there's just too many guys that that would probably get it. Um, although Jimmy Butler didn't play that many games either, so hey, maybe he somehow that's takes true. his way in. But like second team is certainly possible. I feel like third team is probably yeah, that's a lock. Uh, he, he's an All NBA player, like uh, that's not a problem. So yeah, at that point, for an All NBA player, consistently on, you've clearly made another leap. You're on a team that's that's good, that's a that's a legit playoff team, and it's making noise in the playoffs. And especially considering, I mean, he started the All Star game as an injury replacement, but he started the All Star game. Uh, his his son is honestly a huge part of his super superstar identity. He sure. checks off every box of a superstar player at that point. I don't think it's really, I don't think it's that hard of a decision to make. I'll pretend it is for the sake of the argument, but it's not. He's like, he clearly would be a superstar at that point. All right, so we've done a lot about Jason Tatum, and uh, we were joking about this even before the show started, Jared. This is it's kind of like the you know, of the year sort of show, because, you know, let's just call it player of the year in terms of most valuable player with, with Jason Tatum. And now everybody it's everywhere, man. Like you, after a, a big win, it's Ime Odoka belongs in the coach of the year conversation. I have two guys that should be defensive player of the year, Robert Williams and Marcus Smart. I, I think let's start with that one because that, and, and I know we agree on this is certainly the most realistic avenue for Boston to get an end of season award. Who does get your vote though, between these two, because they've both been incredibly impactful in different ways, obviously between uh, big Bob there, who's just dunking like you read about and smart. Who's taken all the credit for all the turnaround success. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll give it to smart uh, one just cause I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the body of work shouldn't matter. It's an award for an individual season, but I guess there's a bit of a smart has been kind of building up the defensive identity, helping the the rest of his teammates grow defensively over the years. So maybe you give a little bit of that, but I think at the end of the day, it's that smart is the coordinator out there and defense is so much about communication and making reads. And so whatever his role is in the scheme and how a center tends to have an outsized role because they're the ones getting the, the actual stop smarts, a guy running, running the ship and Rob has a huge role in it. And Rob has been, the Rob has taken them to the next level, I would say. But I, I remember sitting courtside. It was the first time I got to sit courtside at an NBA game because we were in Orlando at the beginning of the year, and that's where their media seats are still, one of the few places that does that. And I you I you can tell when you're watching, but you can't really hear it. Smart is talking nonstop the entire time. And what was really interesting is I was sitting right next to the Celtics bench. 
he would come over in between during dead balls and he would be discussing coverages and different things like that with Udoka at any moment that he could get. He is just such an active extension of the, of the coaching staff out there every single game. He is just so intimately and persistently involved with every little nook and cranny of this defense. And so that's why I think it's pretty easy for me to give him the nod there. And he is, a, it's a legit, they have a legitimate, um, uh, chance of winning it because Draymond Green definitely does not have the games played. I think he probably would have clearly won it if it weren't for that. So, and Giannis's defense hasn't quite been at the same level this year. Uh, Joel Embiid hasn't quite been at the same level this year. Like there's, there's legitimate open competition to get this spot. I do, I do want to acknowledge Marcus's tweet from, uh, I guess two days that was ago. Good. That was good. That was good. Since somewhere the fine print in winning this is rule 47.1 a no NBA guards without the initials GP are allowed to win defense player of the year. Uh, I, I, I did think it was interesting that, well, one, it's uh, whatever. He's sometimes vocal on Twitter. So I guess it's interesting in and of itself that he's already sort of prefacing the whole thing by putting this out there, but also just the fact that, the, I mean, we haven't had a defensive player of the year in the NBA who is a guard since Gary Payton and whatever it was 95 or 96, it's been a long time. Obviously is there a guard bias toward this award? He said his case, there is, I mean, there, there is a big man bias, and then there's a wing bias because the bigs are the ones everything usually funnels to, and then the wings are the ones that are kind of taking on all the other scores. So, yeah, like, I remember when I did that piece, Smart was making the point that point of attack defense, you're not you're the one kind of setting the tone rather than getting to finish the play, and so it's unheralded, but it's extremely important. I totally agree with that. Like, I, I didn't write the story thinking, like, it was bullshit. Like, it's a legit, it's, it's a very legit argument. Um, it's just really hard to argue that the person that's kind of like setting the tone for the play is making a greater impact than the person who's actually finishing off the play, even though you could argue that one doesn't really work without the other. Um, so I don't really know. I, like I've thought a lot about it. A lot of people have thought about a lot about it. I don't really know how to navigate the bias of process first results in that case. Um, but, you know, it's like, what's I think what's interesting is that you look at the people that he's really fighting for the award with because, like, Bam hasn't played enough and Draymond hasn't played enough and Rudy's also missed a bunch of games. Not a ton, though. It's like you got Giannis, who's, you know, still a legit candidate there. Mikhail Bridges with Phoenix has been unbelievable. He's probably the best wing defender in the league as far as, like, typical style wing defender. And then Triple J in Memphis. You know, Memphis has a ton of narrative going for it with the improvement that it's made. He's he's been phenomenal. Um, so, you know, you have those guys. Uh, and then obviously Evan Mobley has been like pretty amazing in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Jared Allen, I don't know if he's gonna have games played at this point. We'll see. Um, but he's been really good too. And then I guess DeJounte Murray probably could get into that conversation, but I just can't imagine somebody from San Antonio with how their team has been this year, uh, winning it. So it's like, yeah, smart, smart's the guard in this conversation. It seems like this year. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's hard. I'm, I'm with you. It's always a big man award. So obviously Rob might have like more juice, so to speak. The fact that smart guards up frequently, and I don't think that gets, you know, played into account enough how he, you know, look, this team switches everything and the way they switch is really, really fun to watch. But like, Ime and everybody else is very comfortable of smarts on Kevin Durant. It's like, uh, well, yeah, we're fine. We're not going to scram and try and switch him out of this. He's going to hold up. I'll never forget, and I know this is years ago, the Atlanta playoff game where Paul Millsap was going absolutely berserk, and Brad's like, all right, Marcus, go over there and figure this out. <laughs> and smart goes on Paul Millsap, and Paul Millsap like doesn't score the rest of the game. So it's the ability to do stuff like that at that size you just don't see. I mean, it's really – I mean, you talk about Mikhail Bridges – I mean, the guy is breathtakingly good at defense. And the fact that he can guard up and guard down is amazing. But him guarding up is a little easier to understand because, you know what, he's a little bit taller. For the, for Smart to be able to do what he does at his size, I think is truly like one-of-one one type stuff. Like I, You just don't see many people like that in the NBA at all. And, you know, Boston might have a few of them with, you know, I'm not saying Derek White is it can do what Marcus does, but they also have another good guy that's really good defensively who's been – really good all year long and Derek white, they just have, they have so many guys. It's so it's kind of hard to pick the, the, the front runner, so to speak. I think again, Rob gets a lot of the attention because of the loud blocks that he has, but I'm with you. Like in the point about being courtside and listening to smart, call everything out and basically be, 
you know, the, the quarterback of the entire defense and, and setting everything like is something that people are definitely not going to take into account when you factor in his case. Like, because not everybody's sitting courtside. Everybody has the ability to listen to what these guys say while they're on the floor. We're listening to Mike Gorman call the game. We're listening to, uh, uh, you know, Stan Van Gundy talk about how much he loves his defense. We're not listening to Marcus Smart talk. And that's what I think it's lost in translation here a lot of times about Smart's importance on the defensive end is that he is literally their glue guy. As much as you could, you want to point out, you know, Tatum's emergence on that end or, you know, Brown's steadiness or, or Rob's just uniqueness. Like Smart is still the guy that stirs the drink. And he's just, I mean, I, 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 it's refreshing to see because last year, Jared, this is not the guy that we saw. He was, either banged up or like, I'm not quite sure what happened last year. Maybe you have a little more insight to that, but like, this is a, a much yeah. better Marcus smart defense performance from game one to game, whatever one right now, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think he was completely healthy last year. And I just think this team, like I remember last year, later in the season, noticing how he was making a bunch of errors and I was going back to like watch them. And a lot of it was that Evan Fournier would blow a switch and he's like, crap, what do we do? Or like trying to communicate. And then he's trying to figure out like, how do I fix this? So a lot of it was that yeah. the defense wasn't holding up and he looked bad because he was the one trying to clean up a lot of the mistakes. Or he's out there with Kemba. There's not really anybody you could target when they have their, their main lineups out there, especially in Grant, it's defending well too. So I think that's, and that's one of the main things with this team is that it's not like with a team like Utah or with Milwaukee where you can clearly point to one guy, though like Milwaukee is Drew Holiday, or like Philly. It's like you can't clearly point to one guy who's doing it all for this team, cleaning everything up. They're a great defense because they're a great team defense. Well, maybe that's what makes the difference between their like over-the-top absurd defensive numbers in the last couple months and everybody else is just a really good defense. So uh, a couple people had asked uh, in, in you know Twitter form, to discuss defensive player of the year. We did that. Uh, so city of champs here said, uh, I have some thoughts. This team is fun to watch. Awesome to watch again. I agree with Mannix. Now I, I caught some of what Mannix said on NBC, not all of it. So maybe he said something that I didn't hear. One thing that I did hear Mannix say, I don't think he was calling for Eme to be coach of the year, but he, he definitely said Eme deserves, especially if they get to like a top three seed ultimately by the end of the regular season, that he deserves strong consideration for the award based on where they started first year head coach, you know, where they got to overcoming injuries, COVID, like they weren't, you know, like the sons expected to be in the conversation from the very beginning. This was a, a team that, you know, had, uh, had what seemed to be an obvious ceiling, then exceeding expectations and yada, 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 making the case for, for Ime to really be in that conversation. Still don't think he will be unless this team goes out and wins like 55 games, which I don't even know if that's mathematically possible at this point, but you know, it's, I, I just think I, we're, it sort of goes back to the tone of this whole show, right? We're, we're reaching a little bit. We're, we're pretty excited about this, but I, I think when we start to get into, you know, and, and I love the job that Brad has done this year. We talk about it all the time on this show. You, like you can't find a bad move from Brad so far in my mind. At worst, you can find an even move that helped both teams, but I don't think you can find a bad move yet from Brad Stevens as, as you know, in, in his Pobo role. But to be anointing these two guys in their first years on the job, I'm, I'm just not going there, Jared. I, I think Ime not getting coach of the year is just more about Monty Williams being such an overwhelming, uh, obvious choice. Yeah. And then Taylor, Taylor Jenkins. Taylor Jenkins. Is Spolstra. Being and, yeah, actually, Spolstra is a pretty great one that probably should get consideration considering he never has any of his guys in there. Ridiculous. The, they have the number one seed. And Ridiculous. Then, this is kind of cooled off, but like JV Baker staff in Cleveland, they were just so good early. Amazing. On. Think, yeah, he's lost a little steam. But like Memphis has been the beautiful story of the season. Uh so Taylor Jenkins gets it there. But like the Suns are gonna win like 65 games. Uh it, it's insane what they're doing. And it's not as shocking for people because of how good they were in the postseason, but relative to last season, it's an unbelievable accomplishment. So Monty Williams is like, I think, a pretty obvious choice for coach of the year. You can debate between him and like Jenkins and Spolstra, but Ime, Ime is such a compelling story as a coach of the year because what he did early on wasn't working and he really stuck to his guns, made a few tweaks, and then they really took off. So it's a really fascinating story. But like, I mean, hey, if, if they keep playing 700 ball, you know, like 700 winning percentage ball the rest of the year and they win, what, like 52 games or something like that, you know, that then that's different because their schedule is pretty loaded this month. But we got to remember while – 
we're, we're feeling great about this team right now because this last week or so, they've beat a bunch of good teams. A ton of their wins were just coming against like contenders with nobody available, bad teams, stuff like that. So a lot of what makes them look good is that they're winning against a bad schedule. So if this continues and they're winning at an insane clip, they're losing once every five games and they're continuing to win after that, they don't go on losing streaks for the rest of the year, then like, sure, he could get just high enough. And maybe if like Memphis or Miami slows down, he could get there. But I don't see him cracking the top four of this coach of the year race. Um, and then as far as Brad, I mean, he sold out long term with on the Horford deal because like Alperin Shengun looks like a really exciting player. That's the guy that was taken with the pick that they traded away. Um, Shengun's a really, really interesting player who's going to be in the league for a long time. He's only 19 or 20 right now. So like they sold out and Horford is he's actually been pretty good lately. Like his defense has been really good. He's moving the ball really well, been been an important part of their offense getting better. And now he's shooting, I think like 36, 37% from three. So like now that he's shooting pretty average, he's he's good. Like he's been good for them. So they paid they paid a price that you wouldn't usually pay for a guy playing at his level most of the season. But maybe if this keeps up and they actually like do some major winning, then that's when you start to think the trade really was worth it. Um, but you know, like Stevens made a bunch of moves where he sacrificed pretty, pretty notable assets relative to who he was getting with him and white. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the, the problem with the executive of the year is that you vote on it before the playoffs. So it's like the, right. the award is a joke. The award, it's a horrible award. It's completely meaningless because like the Celtics built this team for the playoffs. So like, who cares what they do in the regular season? <laughs> like, getting Al Horford, getting Derek White, those are those are moves for the postseason and kind of like, you know, the, it was kind of a future as well. So you can't judge, really, Steven's job until we see how the season plays out. And then also you just have Daryl Morey making the Harden trade, and then he gets his guy in the end, and none of us thought that was possible up until, like, a day before the deadline. I just can't imagine him not getting executive of the year. Like, I feel like he's probably got that locked up. I'm sure there's somebody I'm forgetting that made a bunch of moves this off season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, a tourist car, car, Carsonovis, I always forget how to say it in Chicago. Like they, you know, they were really good with all the moves he made. The DeRosa deal obviously paid off great. Lonzo and, and Caruso were great for him. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I, I hate the executive of the year award because it's, it's the award is always about who made moves to get their team really good right now. It doesn't reward like people that have been building up that they set the, they set the wheels in motion years ago and now it's finally paying fruition, which is like as a GM, you're supposed to be making moves that don't like make your team good overnight. You're supposed to be making moves in general that build up your team over time so that you have sustained success. So we kind of give the executive of the year award to teams that have maybe sometimes taking a shortcut to get to success and we reward them for it. But like, any co any executive like like uh in Chicago, if that team or like or like Philly's the best one. Like Philly, they gave up long term assets in order to get James Harden, who like could leave. So if like if this team doesn't win the championship and Harden leaves, then that trade was a horrible mistake. So Mori could win executive of the year for it, and then it turns out <laughs> that, that he screwed up the franchise for it. You know, I, I mean I love the like I love I love the trade. It was a great trade. He definitely should have done it. But like this this award Brad Stevens might have done an incredible job this year, and we'll see how that plays out. We'll see how it works out long term. And the moves that he made this year might have set him up to make some great moves next year to solidify this team as a top-notch contender for the next four years. But we just we're not going to know before this regular season is over. I'm voting for Polenka. So I said I'm voting for Polenka. Yeah, Palenka yeah, good job. But like, like, look at what Polenka. Like, their Y Y League team. Like he he sold out the future so insanely hard because um, look at like what happened with Miami and Boston the right. next year after they had those bubble runs. So he got lucky. I mean the team was really good, but they weren't they weren't amazing. They were really good, but they weren't amazing. And then this the future of this team is done for. Like, oh yeah, I mean they're they're, they're going to have won the title, and we're going to people are going unequivocally people are going to look back at the LeBron era in LA and call it a failure. Just too bad because every I think every GM in the league agrees. If you if your team is a disaster for seven years, if you get a championship out of it, who cares? Like you got the championship, that's all that matters. So it's not the way with the Lakers, though. Yeah, but the Plinkett did what he was supposed to do, and it worked. So at the end of the day, he did the right thing. But they've made mistakes ever since then. Right. And whether you want to blame him or LeBron for it, either way, like they've made like they're not they're not there because they sold the farm and won a championship and they were screwed. Like they were there because the because the rust trade and because they didn't get shooters. Yeah, it's it's what they did after winning a title. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so 
Oh, well. Going back to email, because I've gotten this question a lot and, and does not deal with coach of the year about uh, the, the way that, you know, night to night, it looks great. They're winning games, but the rotation is so short. Guys are playing so many minutes, obviously. Are we worried come the playoffs that the wear and tear of just getting there in the regular season and, and climbing out of the play in tournament and into the, whatever seed they f- wind up finishing in is, is going to have been too much. Is, is this a little bit of, of mismanagement in terms of, you know, some of the roster? Not up to this point, because they had to not suck anymore to make the playoffs. So <laughs> now they've done that part. Now they've got, like at this point, if they finish at the five seed, great. Who cares between the five? You don't even really want the second seed because you don't want to see Brooklyn in the first round anyway. So sure. you want to be in that six through three range, ideally. Um, I don't even know if you want the one seed, honestly. You want the four. See Brooklyn. And who knows? Toronto could do seed. some too. Yeah, so you want you want somewhere in the three to six range. Um, and so at this point, I mean, they have to keep winning to maintain. The, East, the other teams at the top of the East are playing really well. So they have to keep up. They can't fall behind. But it looks like they have enough cushion to the play-in. They should be okay. And so at this point, I really think he's got to just, just get Horford and Rob's minutes down. You just brought in Daniel Tice. Daniel Tice is fine. And he's not playing most of these games. And like it was fine when Horford played that big one against Memphis. Like, yeah, good. Get him out there and play him 35 minutes when you have to. But in general, keep that dude down to like 20 minutes a game when you can. Keep Rob Williams down. Rob Williams, every single year, has had a wear and tear injury. Last year, he missed the playoffs because of a wear and tear injury. It was like, was it a bone bruise in his foot? Like, you got to. You gotta pace these dudes. Um, you know, Jalen and Jason, like I'm not too concerned about. Smart, uh, I mean, you have to put him in a straight jacket if you want to keep him under 32 a night, right? So <laughs> it, it's it's I think with those guys it's fine. It's really it's the guys that you have legitimate concerns about their wear and tear because of stuff that's happened in the past. That's who I'm really concerned with. Um and you know, Jalen's another one, like Jalen picks up so many minor knocks all the time, but I feel like he's had enough times where he's had to sit out and rest that you probably don't need to start sitting him out or dramatically cutting his minutes or things like that. And there is always that push and pull of you don't want to ramp a guy down too much because you don't want him to lose his momentum. And Tatum, Brown, Smart, those guys have really good momentum right now offensively. Even Smart shooting has kind of started to come around. He's shooting pretty much right below league average as opposed to 25% over the last couple months. So you don't want to lose that momentum, but you are right. You don't want you don't want them to you don't want to lose a momentum because they're worn down either. And I think it's really, it's the centers where they have, they like, they have a guy they're paying money to who we know that can play, who they can very obviously put in and still continue to most likely perform at the same level. Yeah. And the thing here is as well, if you look at their schedule, they only have two more back to backs left. Uh, Denver, Oklahoma city is one. And it looks like here, Chicago, Milwaukee at the end of the year is the other. So Beginning of the year, they I felt like they had a bunch of back-to-backs or a bunch of games relatively close together. Like if you go back to January, you know, if you go, I'll go all the way back to the beginning of the month. They go five, six, eight. So there's three games in four nights, 10, 12, 14, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, 25. I mean, all that right in a row. That's a lot of games and not a lot of time. They're, the, re- the last part of their schedule here is a little bit more fanned out. So they're going to be able to get some rest on off days. I'm not sure. I mean, the practice nowadays, I think is, I'm not sure if they're practicing that much anymore. Anyway, um, they'll get some rest then. Um, and I think that's going to be big. Of course, at the end of the year, they'll have a couple of tough games. You know, that, that back to the back at the end is kind of brutal between Chicago and Milwaukee, depending on what Chicago team we see. Uh, Memphis is the last game of the season. Um, but there's some opportunities for guys to get some off nights and get some rest like Monday, March 21st against the, the Thunder. I mean, look, I like the, I like watching the Thunder. I mean, Josh Giddy is fun as hell. Shea is amazing. But, like, you might be able to set, you know, Al Horford in that game or might be able to really manage his minutes or really manage Rob's minutes. It's not like they have a bunch of games at the end of the season right in a row. They can, they can space it out a little bit. I think they'll be fine. I'm not worried about having a short bench at this point. It's, it, look, you're going to ride with what got you here. And they are, you know, eight, nine deep pending the night, but most of the time eight deep, and there weren't a lot of games that way. But, you know, Sub in a Daniel Tice here a little bit more and, you know, give Al a little bit of a rest or maybe play Grant a little more. They'll figure out a way to, to just manage everything. And the only guy that I'm really concerned about this at all, I mean, Rob, obviously, because of the way he gets dinged up. But the only guy that, that makes me worried at all about minutes is Al. And if you can find a way to keep Al as fresh as possible, then you're going to be you're going to be fine. But, the, you know, I'm, I, the people that are concerned about minutes at the end of the year, I think are. I mean, I get it. But at the same time, it's like I think we're going to be fine. 
The tough one is they have that back-to-back in Toronto at the end of the month where they're home at Minnesota. And I think it's a 6 o'clock game on a Sunday night, so like there's a little bit of time. But going to Toronto sucks now because of the whole testing thing and customs right. and all that. So it's a pain in the ass. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they just like flew in that morning and actually went to bed before. But, I mean, I don't know how that stuff works. But so that's a tough one. And then the Milwaukee back-to-back at the very end of the season – it's probably going to be a really important game, although who knows? That's like one where they make the call like the morning of, essentially. But they do have a couple days off, and then they have the last game against Memphis. I assume no one's playing in that game anyway, so maybe they'll play guys in that one. But like you could give Horford a break. It's it's simple as Horford's the one guy that you want sitting out back to backs while you can, and you got Daniel Tice. Like Daniel Tice is a very similar player who knows like how to do everything. So I yeah, think that's, that's the one. Where I had a I had a real big problem with and I mean you know the podcast was great Lowe and Simmons uh, on Lowe's podcast the other day but they they poo pooed the Daniel Tice thing I'm like you guys know he's there just because he's familiar with the system they know what he can do he'll come off the bench to spell Al Horford like this isn't really like some needle moving thing it was just a, a way to preserve their big guys for the end of the season I didn't understand I, mean, I, I think I think it's just that like why are they committing this much money to Tice when he, he could move in the off season. Yeah. Maybe, but are you going to lose? Is that are you going to be able to move him and not have it be a negative value deal? You know that's sure. tough. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's why, especially it just doesn't make sense to trade for that guy and then not be playing him. I get like you don't you don't pay set what it's six seven million dollars multiple years to your backup backup. They have a three man big rotation. Yeah. He's not in it right now, so he's getting paid an insane amount for someone who's not being paid. Uh, that's not playing. And it's not like the Wancho situation where they knew they were going to be able to get off right. the money pretty soon. Like he's committed long-term, um, but at the money he's getting, he should be fine. I, I assume. Uh, so if there, I think it's that everyone that I was talking to when that trade went down was saying, this is for, if they move Horford in the off season, mm-hmm. Horford's playing well, like Horford right now, you're not looking, you're not looking to move Horford the way that you were four months ago. Like you're, sure. you're, you move hard for it if you have the opportunity to, uh, but you're not looking to just dump him until you had to have somebody to replace him. No, it does make you wonder, I guess, from just a financial standpoint, if in fact the the reported offer of them, you know, having two second round picks from the Lakers for Schroeder or whatever that was, was actually on the table versus taking on all the Tice money. Yeah, I mean, it does make you wonder I why not just go in that direction. So. I think they would have clearly done. I have not heard that that was on the table, but I don't know. Yeah, I remember seeing it on Twitter um, at, at the time, but whatever. It do- doesn't matter. What's done is done. Where, where I want us to wrap with this for however long it takes, and we won't go too long. Honestly, like, I could go hours on this topic. I almost want to go hours on this topic. We won't. But, like, I, I, if not for Jason Tatum doing the Jason Tatum things that he's doing, I would have started with this in, in this show, which is Isaiah Thomas. All right? We, we just had that you know, reunion part, whatever with, with him and Charlotte, his second game there and goes against the seas and what he play 11 minutes had five points, went one for four, I think from the field, it's a, he was nothing special, but you know, he, he really hasn't been for the most part since uh, he left Boston, largely through no fault of his own. I'm not putting that on him, but you know, it, it, in particular, it's listening to him the other day about you know, hey, man, like, did did you try and get back to Boston? You know, all those, you know, since he left, it, like for anyone that doesn't know, since he was traded away in the Kyrie Irving deal in 2017, he's been with Cleveland, the Lakers, Denver, Washington, Pelicans, Lakers again, Dallas, and now Charlotte. Like the guys played for a third of the NBA at this point and listening to him. It 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 makes me sad. It, it makes a lot of people sad. It's a borderline sports tragedy what has happened you know to to his career from when he was thinking people were going to back up the Brinks truck to now half you know dozen years later not even just trying to stay in the league but the discourse at least on social media surrounding Isaiah Thomas at this point is so stupid is just so dumb. Uh, like I, I get wanting the storybook ending because I have to believe most people know he's not remotely the guy that he once was again, not his fault, but he's not remotely the guy that he once was. You know, if, if anyone really across the NBA thought he could be a helpful player at this point in time, he'd get that opportunity. He's, you know, he, he doesn't remotely fit this team one. They don't need the point guard, but two, 
defensive liability and their identity is defense. It doesn't make a lick of sense. But even if earlier in the year before they got into this groove, you could have argued, you know what, man, like, th- like this was all, what's all over my mentions, like could have thrown him a 10 day, like throw him a bone. And it sounds like without him coming out and saying the words, you listen to his tone, you listen to what he did say. He seems, you know, offended, pissed, you know, that, that he didn't get that opportunity from, from Brad Stevens. Maybe he's not, I haven't spoken with him directly, but you just listen to him obviously. And, and what he sounds like, he sounds like someone who feels like, you know, it's just a, a continuation of, of a raw deal that is totally derailed his career and derailed his life. And, and, and I hate that we're even, I know I'm perpetuating it right now, but I hate that we're even still talking about the, what needs to happen with Isaiah Thomas as though like he's owed something here by the Boston Celtics. You have to bring him back and make this happen. I just, I, I, I don't like it. I feel like there's Jared, there's a lot of just uh, a lot of emotion out there on social media, not a lot of logic. Yeah, I don't really read any of that stuff because it's ah, you're missing out. It's irrational. Yes, sorry, people. Great times. I I do not look at my mentions, folks, because I got enough death threats over the last couple of years. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna st- I'm gonna stop. <laughs> so I keep um, you light. I yeah. Um, so I uh, did talk to him, and I can tell you that you know, so we, we had a sit down. It's on the athletic. I'll shameless plug myself at least once. At least uh, I had a one on one with him. It was really good. Uh, he. I think the the big thing that I think is incorrect about what you're saying is that he he does not have that resentment expectation things of that like like you're saying. I think he he was just super hopeful and thought that they would want to bring him back because they know that he can make that impact in the locker room. And his big pitch in his press conference, his pitch to me, it wasn't as much about like he kept saying like if they don't even want to play me, okay. I think it's that they need my veteran presence. And when I saw them struggling earlier in the year, I thought, I don't know what's going on in that locker room, but I know that I can bring that veteran presence that they need. I know I can bring them that sense of accountability and understanding how to work and all that kind of stuff. And so he's obviously, he was disappointed because he just, like he told me when Brad got the, I'm going to get my shot now because Brad loves me and we have a great relationship. Uh, But Brad didn't give him that because the team didn't like. I, I kept wondering. I, I was hearing that they were probably going to do this, and you know maybe Jabari Parker may, might have counted. But like, I kept waiting for them to get that end of the bench vet guy. You know, a lot of these teams, it doesn't happen as much anymore. And it made that point. You don't see it as much anymore, even with the two ways, which have to go to younger guys basically. But I, I thought the Celtics would get that. You know, Udonis Haslam, thirty-five year old who's been in the league forever. You know, it's funny. IT mentioned Taj Gibson and Derrick Rose, how like everywhere Tibbs goes, he always gets Taj Gibson. He brings Derrick Rose now with him everywhere. But like Taj Gibson is that guy. Taj Gibson sits at the precipice or at the you know, very edge of the rotation, but he's that guy. He's Tibbs' guy. And he was hoping that he could be Brad's guy. It didn't happen. And even IT said it probably is never going to happen. And I don't think I conveyed in there anywhere that there should be an expectation that IT should get a shot with the team. I Basically, I, what I communicated in the part that I was writing was that the Celtics didn't really do that Udonis Haslam type, and IT thought that he could be that guy. Um, you know, and, and like the thing is, I don't think the Celtics were in the position to have a roster spot that was being going to someone that they didn't plan to play at all. They, at least earlier on, were trying to figure out everybody one through 13 on the roster could they play. And ironically, now they only play eight guys in games. So that doesn't happen anymore. So maybe now there is the, there honestly, now is the time where there is the room for IT on the, on the roster just as a veteran leader. But their, their locker room doesn't seem to need anything at this point. So you don't really want to bring in that personality anymore. And IT even said, I'm going to be me at this point, and I'm, you know, like, thankfully the Hornets are a team that wants me to be a loud vocal presence in the locker room. Do you think, and I'm not saying this is the case, I just think it's a reasonable question to ask. How dare you? Do you think that, whether last year or this year, you know, and last year probably all the more, you know, justification than this year because of how that team played and how it went and all the missing bodies and everything from injuries and COVID and the availability to bring a guy like him in, but is there... Is there a non-basketball reason? We can outline all the basketball reasons to not sign Isaiah Thomas even to a 10-day deal. Is there a non-basketball reason that went against him? You know, for the 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 view of him just trying to like just the possible distraction of 
of, you know, trying to, I'm not saying he would even be doing this, but I don't know, fan expectation of like reclaiming what once was and, you know, the, the storybook ending or, or like maybe this, you know, we don't want this. This isn't the guy like when he was in LA, this isn't the guy we want taking over a huddle. They, they don't at this point, I think I don't, they don't need that, that voice. They don't need that Udonis Haslam at this point. Um, as far as the distraction thing, like he said, he thought that was part of it. Uh, I, I, he certainly, he made it sound like he was getting that feedback from people around the team that that was part of it. But I mean, they just had taco taco was like, people called it a sideshow and mm -hmm. it like, like no, taco was like, like taco was a legitimate player. And I mean, he was, it was, it was erratic, but and he was like really beloved by everybody there. Like I have a great relationship with them. Everybody's great relationship with them. He was loved. Uh, but yeah, there was the sideshow aspect of like people chanting for him at games. It was a distraction. Like there was, you know, the public was trying to impose the rotation onto the coach, but like that happens all the time with all sorts of players. So having one guy that people really love at the end of the bench, I, I think that's, I don't think that was going to be an issue. So I, I disagree with that. Um, but maybe it's like just enough of a thing that it's like, if you can choose to go for somebody else, then choose to go for somebody else. Cause you can mitigate it there. But I just, I find it hard to believe that that was a, a significant contributing factor to him. But it was, you know, sure it was a factor, just like it was probably a factor with deciding whether or not to keep Taco, but they thought it was worth it for a certain point. But they didn't keep Taco this year. I'm pretty sure they could have kept Taco this year if they wanted to, and they didn't. So, it, you know, there's a certain, there was a certain, uh, what do you call it, uh, scale, or equilibrium, mm -hmm. whatever the hell it is, uh, of like weighing mm -hmm. on one side the, the benefit of, what he can bring to the table versus the cost of what level distraction a player will bring. Um, and just the, the benefit wasn't in IT's favor with Boston, not really needing a just offensive pull-up scoring point guard at this point. Like they, they got Peyton. They'd rather invest in Peyton and then fill out the roster with shooters that are over six foot four. In terms of IT, the non-basketball stuff almost like doesn't matter to me. Like the basketball reasons are enough for me to not keep IT on this team. And I love Isaiah Thomas as a guy that's five foot six and watched a guy that's five foot eight go uh, toe to toe through to go bear in certain situations and like just attack him. Um, I've all loved the world for I Isaiah Thomas. There's no question about that. But like, man, it just doesn't doesn't work. Yeah, I, I it sucks it had to end this way. Um, and I don't I don't really see a reunion maybe ever coming, and, and that just stinks. But the one thing that is in Isaiah's favor is everywhere he goes in Boston, you'll you'll just get a lot of love, and that's really amazing. It really is. So. Um, best of luck to him. I hope everything works out, but I, it's unfortunate that, uh, they, it's unfortunate he can't seem to find any like steady ground anymore. It's like just a matter of 10 days here and there, maybe like a full off season. And then maybe he can get something that, that little bit more permanent than 10 day deal. But you know, he had, a, it was a fun run, man. It was amazing. It was amazing. No, oh, it's, I mean, Celtics fans will remember it forever, at least of that generation or, you know, like Jared, if you were at the garden every night, like the, the people that were around for that, you know, couple of years in particular where he was an all-star. It's and, and that obviously pointer against like, Miami was outrageous. I mean, it was yeah. really just was so stupid. And they, I think he hit one three. I, I may have been against Justin Winslow, but um, I, I don't remember. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to wrap up this show. I, I mentioned earlier on the show, guys, I didn't know if it was even mathematically possible for the Celtics to win 55 games. I did the math. Uh, they've won 40 and they have 15 left. So uh, they let's see if they finish strong. Go on a well. This will be your final question, Jared. Uh, how many games of these last fifteen do you think they're going to win without actually dissecting the schedule, just throwing out a number? Look at the schedule really quick, and I will say ten. Okay, 15, good season. Fifty win team. I mean, I, I like think, that. I like I think, that. I think there'll be some schedule losses in there, but you know, fifty wins considering how the season started is pretty amazing. This has been Celtics Beat. Ton of fun for Evan, for Jared. I'm Adam. We'll catch you again next week after a few more C's win. See you later.